Good morning everyone and a very warm welcome to the online service of Helensborough Parish Church together with our friends from Rue and Shandon and especially big hello to anyone who is watching for the first time whoever you are and wherever you're from it's great to have you with us. As we come together to worship the Lord why don't we prepare our hearts and our minds with a prayer. Let's pray. Come all who are thirsty, says Jesus our Lord. Come all who are weak. Taste the living water that I shall give. Dip your hands in the stream. Refresh body and soul. Drink from it. Depend on it. For this water will never run dry. Come all who are thirsty, says Jesus our Lord. As we begin our service, let's listen together to our introit brought to us by the choir of Helensborough Parish Church. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. <laughs> In our service today, we're going to be looking at one of the hardest things that Jesus ever said and thinking about what we are willing to do to follow him. That passage and questions are reflected in our call to worship. Please do join in if you would like to with the words in yellow. The Lord invites us to follow him. We take up our cross. Help us to follow you, Lord. The Lord invites us to grow in our relationship with him. We are his disciples. Help us, Lord, to grow in faith. The Lord invites us to answer the question, Who do you say that I am? We say, you are the one who meets us here the Lord our God. Our opening hymn this morning helps us focus our minds on the heart of our worship and is brought to us by our praise band. When the music fades. <laughs> Oh 
Father, who art in heaven. Yes. Don't interrupt me, I'm praying. But you called me. Called you? I didn't call you, I'm praying. Our Father, who art in heaven. There, you did it again. Did what? Called me. You said, Our Father, who art in heaven. Here I am. What's on your mind? I didn't mean anything by it. I was, you know, just saying my prayers for the day. I always say the Lord's Prayer. It makes me feel good. Kind of like getting my duty done. All right, go on. Hallowed be thy name. Hold it. What do you mean by that? By what? By hallowed be thy name. Well, it means, it means, um, don't actually know what it means. How should I know? It's just part of the prayer. By the way, what does it mean? It means honoured, holy, wonderful. Oh, that makes sense. Never thought about what hallowed meant before. <clears throat> thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Do you really mean that? Sure, why not? Well, what are you going to do about it? Doing? Nothing. I guess. I just think it would be neat if you got control of everything down here like you have up there. Have I got control of you? Well, you've got a church. That isn't why I asked you. What about those bad habits you have and that bad temper? You've really got a problem there, you know. And then there's the way you spend your money. All on yourself. Stop picking on me. I'm as good as any of the rest of those phonies at church. Excuse me? I thought you were praying for my will to be done. If that is to happen, it will have to start with one of the ones who are praying for it. Like you, for example. Oh, all right. I guess I do have some hang-ups. Now that you mention it. Could probably name some others. So could I. I haven't thought about it until now, but I'd really like to cut out some of those things. I'd like to, you know... Be really free. Good. Now we're getting somewhere. We'll work together. You and I can have some victories that can be truly won. I'm proud of you. Look, Lord, I need to finish up here. This is taking a lot longer than it usually does. <clears throat> Give us this day our daily bread. Well, you need to cut down on the bread too. Hey! Wait a minute. What is this? Criticise me day. Here I was doing my religious duty and... All of a sudden, you break in and remind me of all my hang-ups. Praying's a dangerous thing. Could wind up changed, you know. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. You called me and here I am. It's too late to stop now. Keep on praying. I'm interested in the next part of your prayer. Well, go on then. I'm scared to. Scared? Of what? I know what you'll say. Try me and see. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. What about Sally? See, I knew it. I knew you would bring her up. Why, she told lies about me, cheated me out of money. She never paid back that debt she owes me. I've sworn to get even. But your prayer. What about your prayer? Well... I didn't mean it. Well, at least you're honest. But it's not much fun carrying the load of bitterness around inside, is it? No, but I feel better as soon as I get even. 
boy, have I made some plans for old Sally. She'll wish she never did me any harm. You won't feel any better. You'll feel worse. Revenge isn't sweet. Think of how, un how unhappy you are already. But I can change all that. You can? How? Forgive Sally, then I'll forgive you. Then the hate and sin will be Sally's problem, not yours. You may lose the money, but you will settle your heart. But, Lord, I can't forgive Sally. Then I can't forgive you. You're right. You always are. And more than I want revenge on Sally, I want to be right with you. All right, I forgive her. Help her find the right road in life, Lord. She's bound to be awfully miserable now that I think about it. Some way, somehow, show her the right way. There now. How do you feel? Hmm. Not bad. Not bad at all. In fact, I feel pretty great. You know, I don't think I'll have to go to bed uptight for the first time since oh, I can't remember. And maybe I won't be so tired from now on because I'm going to get enough sleep. You're not through with your prayer. Go on. Oh, all right. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Good, good. I'll do that. Just don't put yourself in a place where you can be tempted. What do you mean by that? Well, quit hanging around with the wrong people in the wrong places. Listen to people who make you feel angry. Getting yourself into compromising situations. Change some of your friendships. Some of your so-called friends are really beginning to get to you. They'll have you completely involved in the wrong things before long. Don't be fooled. I don't understand. Sure you do. You've done it loads of times. You get caught in a bad situation, you get in trouble and then you come running to me. Lord, help me out of this mess and I'll promise I'll never do it again. You remember some of those bargains you tried to make with me. Yes, and I'm ashamed, Lord, I really am. But you didn't keep your promises, did you? No. Look, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord, I, I really am. Up until now, I just thought that if I prayed the Lord's Prayer every day, then, well, I could do what I liked. I didn't expect anything like this to happen. I love you. I always will. Now go ahead. Finish your prayer. Oh, yeah. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Do you know what would bring me glory? What would make me really happy? No, but I'd like to. I want to please you. I can see what a mess I've made out of my life and can see how great it would be to really be one of your followers. But you just answered the question. I did? Yes, the one thing that would bring me glory is to have people like you truly love me and to be willing to do whatever it takes to follow me every day. Oh. Lord, let's see what we can make of me. Okay? Yes, let's see. Sometimes we just go with the flow, don't we? Follow the crowd, not wanting to stir up trouble or stand out. We like the easy life. Come to church, sing a few songs, recite a few words, enjoy a cup of coffee, feel better about ourselves. It's even easier now that we can do it all in our pyjamas. But that's not what being a Christian is about. And it's certainly not what Jesus tells us our lives should look like. Let's listen together to one of Jesus's biggest and most difficult challenges, taken from Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 38, which one of our young church leaders, Jennifer, is going to read for us. Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. 
he said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Amen. Thank you, Jennifer, for bringing us our reading today and for all you do for our young church. Another member of our young church, Anna, has kindly agreed to recite a poem for us entitled Splintered Messiah. So let's hear that read for us now. Stuart Henderson, Splintered Messiah. I don't want a splintered messiah in a sweat-stained, greasy grey robe. I want a new one. I couldn't take this one to parties. People would say, who's your friend? I'd give an embarrassed giggle and change the subject. If I took him home, I'd have to bandage his hands. The neighbours would think he's a football hooligan. I don't want his cross in the hall. It doesn't go with the wallpaper. I don't want him standing there like a sad ballet dancer with holes in his tights. I want a different messiah, streamlined and inoffensive. I want one from a catalogue who's as quiet as a monastery. I want a package tour messiah, not one who takes me to Golgotha. I want a king of kings with blow waves in his hair. I don't want the true Christ. I want a false one. Today's Gospel reading is a momentous story, a pivotal moment in the life of Jesus and his disciples. The moment it all changes. The disciples are with Jesus in Caesarea Philippi, a village about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. And it was a fascinating village because it was the sort of retirement village for Roman officials the Bournemouth of the Roman Empire, if you will. And for a really long time, it had been the capital of the cults. Caesarea Philippi was thought to be the birthplace of the god Pan, and there were temples and idols aplenty to many, many different gods. So as the disciples walked with Jesus through the village, they would have looked around them at all the temples and the idols and the images of the gods. And it was at that moment that Jesus chose to ask them a simple question. Who do you say that I am? In the midst of all the known gods in the world, who do you say that I am? And Peter turns to Jesus and says, you are the Christ, the one of whom the prophets spoke, the one for who Israel has waited, the one who was supposed to restore God's people. Peter is right, and yet he also doesn't understand. Peter has an image of what the Messiah is supposed to do, um, who the Messiah is supposed to be. We all have our own images and wishes about who Jesus is and what he should do. All is well when Jesus is casting out demons, healing the sick, preventing death and feeding the multitudes. We like that Jesus. We want to follow that Jesus. He is our Lord and Saviour. And Jesus doesn't deny who he is, but he goes on to talk to them 
and this is where our reading starts, about how the Son of Man would suffer and be rejected and killed. What? No, 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 Jesus. No suffering and death. What, what are you thinking? You're the Messiah, the promised deliverer of God's people, Israel. You, you can't die. What are you talking about? Peter is angry, confused, and we read that he began to rebuke Jesus. And I think that we can fully understand the human emotions involved here. Peter has spent many months with Jesus, watching him heal the sick and cleanse the lepers, cure the blind, raise the dead and challenge the religious authorities. Peter has spent many months with Jesus, watching the sheer strength of his ministry and the authority of his word. And now he's being confronted with a future filled with weakness and passivity and vulnerability and Peter didn't want that. He didn't want a splintered Messiah. He wanted a strong God. Like others in Israel, he was expecting a mighty leader from the line of David to overthrow the Romans and restore Israel. And with hindsight, it's easy to see that error. But the reality is that we too are uncomfortable with a splintered Messiah. We all want a strong God. When we're hurt in life, when we suffer loss, when we have to put up with thoughtless words from others, when we're sick and dying, we want a strong God. We want a God who will heal us and justify us or turn our darkness into light. We want a strong God. But the problem is that we see strength from a very human perspective, not from a divine perspective. We understand strength to be the same thing as might, to be the same thing as vindication in the eyes of others. We understand strength to be victory, but that is a frail human perspective. In the eyes of God, strength looks very different. For God, strength is measured in vulnerability, in sacrifice, and by our willingness to endure all things in the name of God. That was the example Jesus, the splintered Messiah, was about to show for his disciples. And this is how he wants us to live our lives too. Jesus will not, however, conform to our images of who we think he is or who we want him to be. Instead, he asks us to conform to who he knows himself to be the one who must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He sets a choice before us and it's a choice that we each have to make again and again. The circumstances of life set that choice before us. We either choose ourselves and deny Jesus, or we deny ourselves and choose Jesus. If any want to become my followers, he says, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Self-denial is the beginning of discipleship. But how we trivialise that call on our lives how we manage to turn such a scandalous phrase into something so tame and parochial. We've all got our crosses to bear. Isn't that just such an easy saying to trip off the tongue? But it is an incredible call on our lives from the man who was walking towards Jerusalem to be tortured and hung on a cross to die. Our splintered Messiah.
I wonder if Peter felt a little let down at this point. I suspect so. Up until then, there was a certain glamour in following Jesus. He was hanging out with the coolest superhero in Israel. The crowds flocked to them and the miracles never stopped coming. The teaching was amazing. And no doubt Peter was enjoying bathing in the reflected glory of Jesus. But now that all changes. The glamour is gone and Peter is left with the cold, stark reality of the pain of discipleship and the agony of realising that if he truly wants to follow Jesus, he can't have it all on his own terms. There is a real cost to discipleship. It is splintered discipleship. We can't have God on our own terms. We can't create a cosy religion or a comfortable way of being. We profess a splintered faith. We are members of a splintered church. There is a real cost to discipleship and it hurts. There is a painful truth in this passage that if we truly want to follow in the way of Christ, then our individual lives and our corporate church life will be more complicated. It is an uncomfortable truth, but it is governed by the knowledge that, as Jesus says here, those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. The way of Christ, self-denial, reminds us that our life is not our own. It belongs to God. It reminds us that we're not in control, God is. Our life is not about us. It is about God. And there is a great freedom in knowing these things. We are free to be fully alive. Through self-denial, our falling down becomes rising up. Losing is saving and death is resurrection. As long as we believe our life is about us, we will continue to exercise power over others, try to save ourselves, control our circumstances, and maybe even rebuke Jesus. Jesus rarely exercised power over others or tried to control circumstances. He simply made different choices. Self-denial is not about being out of control or powerless. It's about the choices that we make. Jesus chose to give in a world that takes, to love in a world that hates, to heal in a world that injures, to give life in a world that kills. He offered mercy when others sought vengeance, forgiveness when others condemned, and compassion when others were indifferent. He trusted God's abundance when others said that it was not enough. With each choice, he denied himself and showed God was present. At some point, those kinds of choices will catch the attention of and offend those who live and profit by power, control and looking out for number one. They will not deny themselves. They will respond. Jesus said they would. He knew that he would be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes. It happens in every age for those who choose the path of self-denial. When it happened for Jesus, he made one last choice. He chose resurrection over survival. If any want to become my followers, Amen. As we reflect upon the passage and the choice and challenge Jesus brings to us, we sing our next hymn, All I Once Held Dear.
come now to our time of prayer with some of the photos from our Lent photo challenge being shown as we pray. Let's pray together. Faithful God, we thank you because you are true. You are light and in you there is no darkness at all. You are ever to be trusted and constant is your love. As we remember how the path Jesus took brought him into conflict with those around him, we are thankful that he never gave up nor allowed himself to be diverted from his purpose. Jesus remained true to his mission, proclaiming your kingdom had come, with good news for the poor, release for the captives, recovery of sight for the blind, and freedom for the oppressed. From our hearts, we thank you for the height and depth, the length and breadth of Christ's love. When on a cross with outstretched arms, he embraced us all. Thank you for the great hope that we have because Christ is risen. One day, there will be no more death or crying or pain that nations shall beat their swords into plowshares and not learn war anymore. Lord God, we ask that you would help us to take up our cross daily, to deny ourselves and choose you over all else. Show us that true strength is found in sacrifice and help us to revel in the freedom that following Jesus brings. Knowing that you always hear us and that there is power in our prayers, we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours forever and ever. Amen. Just one notice to bring to your attention today, and it's that we will be celebrating Holy Communion together on the 7th of March next week. So if you wish to take part, please ensure that you have some bread and wine or juice to hand when you come to watch the service. That's Holy Communion next Sunday. We're going to bring our service to a close today with our final hymn, At the Name of Jesus.
final breath. We go now, walking the way of Christ, sharing the Messiah's good news, prepared to take up our crosses and to be God's people. We go to serve, to live in love and to act with grace. Amen.